Welcome to Liberty Baptist Church and welcome to our resurrection service. Uh, we're glad that you joined in. I hate that we couldn't all be together in this sanctuary worshiping God together, but hey, this is the way it is right now and we're glad that you took time out of your day to uh, tune in with us and, and to worship with us through uh, the preaching and teaching of God's Word. Uh, before we get into the text, I want to uh, talk about, you can't see it, but it's over here to my right hand. We have a poster here that tracks our, um, our giving to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. And uh, we are just short of $400 away from our goal that we set as a church. Uh, and I want to just uh, take a second to say thank you for those who have been faithful to either drop their tithe by the church or to uh, mail in the tithe checks because uh, you know the importance of, uh, of that money and God's kingdom and just keeping your church uh, working uh, in this time, in this pandemic. Uh, but we're $400 short of the uh, Easter offering. We do believe that uh, people are going to continue to give and, um, and hopefully... Uh, the next time you see my face on the screen, we can update you and give you uh, what God has done. And we believe that he's going to exceed the 400, uh, but uh, that remains to be seen at this time. Uh, we want to just uh, take a second and just think about uh, this Easter Sunday and what uh, Resurrection Sunday. The older I get, the, least, the less I call it Easter and the more it is about the Resurrection uh, because that's what gives us hope in this life. Uh, for the last week, I've, I've, I've read through the gospel accounts and I've really wrestled around with what uh, text I was going to preach. And I called a pastor friend of mine and he said, uh, I asked him what text he was preaching, not that I was going to copy him, but I wanted to know uh, where his mind was in this, in this holy week. And, and he said, well, to be honest with you, I'm probably going to preach from Genesis to Revelation, I said, well, thank goodness. I said that uh, I don't feel like I'm out on an island by myself. And so he gave me some great encouragement. Today, we're actually going to be in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 21. That's Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 21. And we're going to look at that. And then we'll kind of land the plane in the, in the resurrection account in Mark chapter 16. But I wanted to look at Romans chapter 5. I mean, how did we get here, where we're at? Not in this pandemic that we're talking about, but how did we get here? How did we get to Resurrection Sunday, the end of Holy Week, well, the start of a new week? How did we get here? I mean, <clears throat> for the next few minutes, I want to unpack Romans 5 and see if we can put what I like to call some paint on an empty canvas and draw us a picture. Now, we live in a society where everybody knows Jesus. If you live in the Southeast, I mean, there's nobody that you can, that, well, I can't say there's nobody. That would be an incorrect statement. But many people that you may try to share the gospel with or something like that to, to talk about Jesus, they've already heard about Jesus and they know about Jesus, right? I mean, everybody knows about Jesus in the, in the Southeast, right? Well, if everybody knows about Jesus, then why under heaven's name does our society look like it does? Why are we so broken? Why are things, uh, so, why is everything such in a fragile and frail state right now with this pandemic sweeping the globe? And if we all knew Jesus the way that we proclaim to know Jesus when we bring him up in casual conversations. I believe, I do believe, that this society that we live in would look a whole lot different than it does today. <clears throat> and that's a fair question, isn't it? I mean, if we say that we're born again, blood-bought believers of Jesus Christ, that's a fair question, isn't it? I mean, in our flesh, my flesh, maybe your flesh, doesn't like to be questioned sometimes. Uh, and we feel like when somebody does pose a question on us, we're just kind of like, man, who are you? to question me on that, you know, what's the, what's everybody always want to say? Well, you ain't supposed to cast judgment, brother. Well, that, and, and we like to take God's word out of context, but why is the resurrection even important? I mean, why is it even important? And what does it mean for me? What does the resurrection mean for Lance Holton? What does the resurrection mean for you, whoever might be watching this? 
on our YouTube channel. What does the resurrection mean for you? And why is the, why is the resurrection of Jesus even necessary in the first place? I mean, why do we have need of a resurrected Savior? And I firmly believe that until we see the crucifixion, until we see the crucifixion of Jesus Christ rightly, we will never see or, uh, the resurrection rightly, nor will we experience the resurrected life. We'll not experience the fullness there of Christ unless we first know about the death and the burial. We can't experience the resurrected life. You must understand about the blood of Jesus because it's the blood that makes all things new. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 14 through 19, and I've quoted this several times here at Liberty, so it's going to be, but I've never really give you the, the text. So here's the text, 1 Corinthians 15, 14 through 19. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we were and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he has raised up Christ whom he did not raise up. If in fact the dead did not rise, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. And you are still in your sins. And then also, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most to be pitied. Do you hear that? If Christ did not rise from the dead, we Christians are most to be pitied. I mean, because if Christ didn't rise, the dead didn't rise, and that means one day we're not going to rise. And th there's no hope in that. And, and what's Paul saying here? If you, if you think living your best life now is our greatest hope, and we don't even have hope because some of us have more than others and some of us go through different hardships that others don't have to go through. And so if living our best life now is, is the hope that we have, that's a futile hope and we don't even really have hope. We don't even know what hope looks like. But hope is Jesus Christ. And let's jump into the text. Join me now in Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 6. And let's, let's read and, and we'll try to unpack this. It says, For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. And therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. And for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of, the, of one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from the one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in the life, the one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as though 
one man's offense, judgment came to all men resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through the righteousness to the eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us pray about that. Father, <clears throat> Father God, I thank you for Romans 5, uh, Lord, verses 6 through 21. And Lord, how we see how sin entered and how uh, Jesus Christ prevailed, your only son, Father God. And we thank you for the blood of Jesus. We thank you for this time to meet. We thank you for uh, your word again. I pray, Lord, that you would hide me behind the cross. Lord, that you may be uh, exalted this morning, that you may be glorified in what's said here in your pulpit. So, Lord, we thank you for Jesus, and it's his name we pray these things. Amen. <clears throat> so, if we start off in verse 6, it says, when we were without strength. Some, uh, some versions say when we, were, when we were helpless. We see somebody that um, says, when we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. It's amazing to me that we see Christ dying for someone that has not accepted him. I mean, we see him dying for the ungodly. We, and it says, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good some would even dare to die. But verse 8 is the, is the crux here for a few moments. It says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I mean, when we think about Good Friday, when we, uh, let's back up a little further. Let's go back to Palm Sunday, last Sunday, Palm Sunday. What were the people doing when Jesus came to Jerusalem? They were laying down their coats. They were laying down branches. They were waving greenery. And what were they hollering? Hosanna, Hosanna. And they were praising Jesus. And that picture turned really quick in just seven days. I mean, it went from praising him to being this healer that had cast out demons, that had crossed stormy seas, that had, had give uh, mute men a tongue to speak with. He had healed the blind. He had stopped the flow of blood. I mean, good night. He had done all these things. And, and, they, and, they're, and they're celebrating this man, God-man, Jesus, Son of God, coming into Jerusalem. But that picture changes really quickly. And I'm just going to tell you, we change really quickly sometimes. Sometimes when we get in certain environments, we change. And that ought not be so. We ought to be consistent. We ought to be salty for the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to be salt and light as, as Scripture tells us to be. And we ought not change and, and, and waver and vary. We ought to be consistent and rooted in a firm foundation. And I'm going to talk a lot about the death of Christ. And I'm going to talk about the blood of Christ this morning. And you're thinking, well, I thought we were here to talk about the resurrection of Jesus. Well, if we don't get this right, we'll never get the resurrection right, like I said a few moments ago. But it says in verse 8, it says, But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. You know what I used to say before I got saved? I used to say, well, one day I'll get right with God. I used to say, eventually I'll, I'll, I'll start going to church and serving and I'll start doing that thing. Well, that really has nothing to do with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't serve at church to be saved. I serve at church because I have a risen Savior that went to a cross and died for me. And when God showed me that and showed me who I was and the wicked man that I was, that I wanted to be a part of his fellowship. Number one, I wanted to be saved. I mean, I can I talk about it all the time. I can think about that summer in 2008. And I often joke with people, but it's really not a joke. I believe if Jimmy Simpler would have gave an altar call before he preached, I would have got saved before he preached the message. 
Now, Jimmy always preaches the gospel. I don't remember what he preached that morning, but I know that I needed Jesus. Why? Because I'd sat under Jimmy and I'd sat under the washing of the Holy Spirit through God's word. And I pray that's what's happening here this morning. And let me just encourage you. If you're putting off Jesus, you're going to put him off until you meet him. And you're not going to meet him as Lord. You're going to meet him as a judge. And I'm not saying that from a place of condemnation. I'm saying that because I love you. Me and my wife were in the uh, living room talking the other night. And I, and I said, Casey, I said, do you believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins? And she said, well, sure I do. And I know she thought that was a stupid question, but she knows me that I wasn't just asking that to ask that. She knew I was going somewhere else. I was leading her. And so then I said, Casey, do you believe hell's real? And she said, Lance, you know I believe hell's real. And I said, Casey, I wonder why we don't tell our friends about it as much as we should sometimes. Because hell's going to be hot in eternity. We can't even fathom in our little finite minds. It's going to be separation from Jesus Christ when he sent his only son so that we might have life. Let's get our minds around that this morning. And and let me just say this. I was going to say it a minute ago, but ADD kicked in and I chased squirrels. You're never going to get yourself good enough. You're, You're never going to get good enough. You're never going to get clean enough. You're never going to quit sleeping around. You're never going to quit drinking. All these things that you think that you got to do to come to Christ. No, you just need to turn and look to the Savior and He will save you. He will save you. He will save you now. He'll save you right now in this sermon. We ain't even got to the end of it. We're like right here just wading off in the water. God will save you now and that's how He does it. And you, but you'll never get clean enough on your own. Because God never intended on us to do it on our own. But yet we want to take this, like it's like it's what we have to do. Like I've got to do this or I've got to do that. No, you've got to accept Christ and let him work in your life. That's what you have to do. The work of Jesus is a finished work. It's not that you're going to add anything to it. Now I hope that we do some things for Christ in this life, in this church, through this Annie Armstrong Easter offering. But God's not just hedging his bets on that. That's why he had Jesus come. And in verse 9, it says, much more than having now been justified by his blood. We don't talk about the blood a whole lot anymore. We don't talk about the blood because it's violent, but yet we watch movies where it's blood and gore all the time. But it's the blood of Jesus that, that, that makes the difference. It's the cross that makes the difference. Uh, I like what Adrian Rogers said. He preached about Noah's Ark one time and how the Ark was a picture of Jesus and the pitch that was on the outside of the Ark to keep the water from coming in was a representation of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's a beautiful picture. The whole Bible is about Jesus. You just have to know the Bible. It's not a bunch of stories that have nothing to do with anything. No, it, it, the whole Bible from Genesis 1-1 all the way to the end of Revelations where he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. The whole thing's about him. And it says, but much more than having been justified by his blood. If you don't know or have experienced the blood of Jesus, then you, you're not saved because it's the blood of Jesus that was, is, a, is a ransom for sins. And it says, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. It's through Christ. It's through his work on the, on the cross. It was, it was a sinless, virgin-born Savior, born, that lived a sinless life, that went to a cross so that we might have life. In verse 10, it says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. It's hard to even get your mind around that verse. It says, for if we were enemies, up until the summer of 2008, I was an enemy with God. I went to VBSs as a boy, but I was an enemy with God. I lived a life of hell in college, but I was an enemy with God. But yet he went to the cross all those years ago with Lance on his mind, 
with you on his mind. That's what he did. And it says that we were reconciled through God through the death of his son. There's not a greater feeling in this world than being reconciled by an all-sufficient Savior. I mean, uh, uh, there's an empty feeling in your life today. And, that, and, and if, if you don't know Jesus, it's because you've not been reconciled. Why not get reconciled on the greatest day uh, Easter Sunday, where we celebrate the resurrection. Why not get reconciled today? And it says, and we shall be saved, saved by his life. And verse 11 says, not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received a reconciliation. And that's what we're doing if you're a Christian. If you're a blood-bought Christian today, you're, you're, you're rejoicing in the fact that we have been reconciled, that we have been saved, that the tomb is empty, that Jesus is sitting down at the right hand of the Father, and we're under the dispensation of grace, and we're just waiting on Jesus to come back and get His bride, the church, us, the saved. Reconciliation. When I got saved, I didn't want to at first because I was scared of uh, what might be on the other end of the phone call when God started putting people on my heart. And, and I hadn't been saved that long and I didn't know all the right things to say. But I knew God moved my heart to call some people that I had uh, taken advantage of and and wronged. And, and God put some people in my heart to call. And, and I would call those people. And some of the people, you know, hardly remembered what I was even calling to ask for forgiveness for. But it wasn't for them. God was doing a work in my heart. And God was showing me that he needed me to stoop down a little bit from my prideful stance and learn, be humbled and learn what it's like to ask for forgiveness for some things that I had done prior to knowing him as Lord. In verse 12, it says, Therefore, just as through one man's sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, and because all sinned. Now, a lot of people don't like the fact when they're told that they're a sinner. Because the next thing they want to say if they don't know Jesus Christ as Lord is, well, you're a hypocrite. Well, you're right. I'm in the flesh. I'm in this Adam suit until I meet Jesus and get my resurrected spiritual body. And so I'm going to, I probably will let you down. When I got voted in as a pastor here at Liberty, I told him, if you see something you like, you saw Jesus. If you didn't see something, if you saw something you didn't like, you saw my flesh. You saw Lance Holton. And you're probably not going to like him. But you're going to like Jesus in me. But you're not going to like my flesh. And we want to say stuff like, well, sin, you know, I'm not a bad guy. Well, I didn't say you was a bad guy. And I never said you were a bad girl. And most people, when they try to share the gospel with people, they're not telling you that you're bad. They're telling you that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. That's all they're saying. But we get so prideful because we want to look to the left and to the right and we want to see a rapist over here and a child molester over here and we want to see uh, somebody that embezzled a bunch of money and caused a bunch of people to lose everything they worked for their whole life and we want to say, well, I'm not those people. Romans 3.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. <clears throat> That's 6.23. I said it, got him out of whack. 323 is for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And all means all, ladies and gentlemen. All means all. Means me. I had to come to a place one day when I figured out that I was a sinner. And it wasn't just the things that I did that made me a sinner. No, that, that, those things facilitated some of the sinning. But I was born a sinner. I was born into sin. We're going to get to it in just a minute. Uh, 623, let me read it again since I messed it up. It says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In verse 13 it says, For unto the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. 
Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Death come into the world in Genesis chapter 3 in the fall of man. And people say, well, it's not a good God to, uh, to, to set somebody up for failure. I don't think that he set Adam up for failure. I mean, we can have a narrow view on things and say, you know, well, he's put this one thing in there that Adam didn't need to fool with. Well, he had a whole garden that he needed to fool with. But, he, we, but just like Adam, I'm not consumed with all that God's given us. A lot of times I want the one thing that God doesn't want me to have. And maybe you can relate to that this morning. And it says in 13, it says, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there was no law. But nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. And even those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him to come. He's a type of Christ. Of, he's a type of Jesus that was to come. He was pointing to somebody. I couldn't get it right, but there's coming one who will get it right. His name is Jesus. But you know, a lot of times we want to say, well, I didn't have any part of what Adam did. It's called guilt by association. We, 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 are, we are descendants of Adam in this flesh. And we don't have any, any say in the matter. We're born into sin. We can't fix that, but Jesus Christ can. And His blood covers us and covers the sin. In 14, it says, Nevertheless, death... Ran I've already read that. Verse 15, it says, But the free gift is not like the offense. That's difficult to wrap our minds around sometimes, that the free gift is not like the offense. Let's read a little further and it explains it better than I probably can. For if by one man's offense, many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. So what are you saying? Well, death entered in through Adam, but Jesus wasn't a plan B or C. Jesus was plan A from the beginning. Death entered through Adam. He was going to be, uh, and, and Jesus Christ was going to fix it on the cross of Calvary. It entered in. So, but we were talking about the offense. Well, it was one offense that causes many to stumble. And then, but I think about all my offenses. I remember when I first got saved, I didn't understand the blood of Jesus. And I would I read my Bible and I would think. I would look back on my life and I would consider all the things that I did, all the offenses. And, and I, I probably was just looking at the highlight reel. I missed a whole lot of them. But I was looking at the offenses and I was thinking, and you're probably going to laugh when you hear this, but I was thinking, man, my sin is going to use up all of Jesus' blood. And, and I know that may be funny, but I didn't know any better because I was a babe in Christ. But Jesus' blood covered Lance Holton. And if you know Jesus as Lord, his blood covered you. In verse 16, it says, And the gift is not like that which came through one man who sinned. For the judgment which came from the one offense resulted in condemnation. We were condemned in Genesis chapter 3. The fall of man. We were condemned. And, 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 it, and, and it was like no hope. And I mean, I don't know if you've ever been in a hopeless situation, but it, it'll take your breath away. It'll take your health away. It'll take your wealth away. It'll take everything you have away from you when you're in a hopeless situation. And that's where we were. That's where I was until 2008. And it says, the, the, it, the, the offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift, well, what's the free gift? The blood of Jesus. You didn't pay anything for that. I didn't pay anything for that. We didn't do anything for that. We didn't do enough good deeds. We weren't born to the right family. But thank God we were born in a free country where we can worship, even though it's kind of being limited right now. Thank God we can worship freely. But it says the free gift which came from many offenses. So I look back at this and I think about all the offenses in my life. And, and, and Jesus' blood one time was good for all those. And that's not to say, Paul talks about it in Romans, where, where, where grace abounds, I can sin much more. He says, no, God forbid that. 
that you pay attention and you, you really see a suffering Savior that died and bled for me and you. In verse 18, it says, finish 17, if, if by one man's offense death reigned through one much more than those who received the abundance of grace. When we get to the abundant Christian life, when we get out of the wilderness wandering from our sinful life and we get through that wilderness wandering period and we start walking with Jesus and He's the Lord of our life. He's the Lord of our finances. He's the Lord over our job. And we answer to our boss men, but we work for Jesus when we go. And sometimes I struggle with that. It's not that I don't respect the people I work for. It's just sometimes my flesh is sorry. I said it for maybe some of you that was thinking it. In verse 18, it says, Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men. And you say, I don't want it. I, I don't accept that. You cannot accept it. You cannot want it all you want to, but it's coming. I mean, the Bible says it's appointed for once unto man to die and then the judgment. So we can meet Jesus Christ as all-sufficient Savior, King, and Lord now, or we can meet Him as judge later. And I, I beg with you, I plead with you, meet him as Lord because the greatest thing that ever happened in my life was me getting off the throne and King Jesus getting on the throne. I've never experienced the fullness of life like I have since Jesus came into my heart. In 19, it says, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. You know, we got an obedient Savior today. We've got an obedient Savior. It says in Isaiah 53 that it pleased God to crush him. I've thought about that all week, that it pleased God to crush Jesus. I mean... I think about my kids, and I want you to maybe consider your kids. I mean, I, I don't want nothing bad to happen to my kids, and I'm sure you don't want nothing bad to happen to your kids. But it says it pleased God to crush him. Why? Because there, was, there, was a, there had to be atonement for sins. And Jesus Christ's blood was that atoning blood. And it pleased God to crush him so that blood could be applied for me and you, so that we could have life and have it more abundantly, so we could go to heaven and leave this world and go worship and, 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 and see Jesus the way that God intended it from the beginning. In verse 20, it says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded... Grace abounded much more, amen? I mean, we look at a life that's troubled. We don't know what tomorrow brings. We go to Walmart. It's like we're in, we're in a communistic country. Somebody did a little documentary on Cuba a while back, and I, I saw how they get treated at the grocery store. And, and when I grabbed hold of my buggy the other day, I felt like I was in, all of a sudden I went to Cuba in my mind. I was thinking, good night. You, can, you get three rolls of toilet paper, uh, don't even look back. It's like Sodom and Gomorrah. If you look back, you're going to get turned to a pillar of salt. Just get your three rolls, keep rolling, keep going. You, you know, you can get one thing of milk. At my house, we have a pile of kids at my house. We, I think we need to invest in some dairy cows and start milking cows because if they start putting a quota on milk, we're going to have a revolt at the Holton household because it's, uh, we just, just got to have it. Maybe we can find a cow that does chocolate milk. It says, but... Moreover, the law entered and the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Amen. I mean, grace abounds much more. And it's good to give grace, not just take grace. I mean, it's good to get the grace of Christ, but it's good to give some grace too. Amen. Not bite everybody's head off that maybe didn't mean to, but wrongs us. Somebody that said something out of the way, or maybe they said something out of context. It just didn't sit well with us. We don't have to mow them down. Nah, we can let grace abound because why? We've been given grace. And in 21 it says, And so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through the righteousness to the eternal life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, that's good news, isn't it? I thought about, we've talked about sin a lot today. We've talked about the blood of Christ a lot today. 
We've not talked about the resurrection a whole lot. We're going to get there in just a second. Because the resurrection is not good news for those who are perishing. The resurrection is good news for those who have confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and have hope to see him one day. That's who the resurrection is good news for. And so the Lord put it on my heart this week that we would spend some time looking at the cross and looking at the blood of Christ because I believe that's what we are in standing in need of today. And then in Romans 10, it says that if you confess with your mouth that the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. See, it's not works. It's confession is made unto salvation. It's believing. It's confessing. Jesus saves. And it says, <clears throat> For the Scripture says, Whoever believes on Him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. Well, what's he saying there? He says there is no, dis no distinction. You can, just because you might have been born into a, a good family, rich, it doesn't, in the distinction here is Jew and Gentile. So we're not Jew born, but we're grafted in now because of the blood of Jesus. Amen? We didn't have hope, but now we have hope. And it says, For the same Lord is over all is rich to whom who call upon him. Our God is rich if you'll call upon him today. If you'll call upon Jesus to save you, become Lord of your life, he'll change you. He'll do things that you never thought about doing. He'll send you places. You'll tell people about him in ways that you never thought or saw yourself doing. And it says, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's Romans 9. That's Romans 10, Romans 10, 9 through 13. I want to land the plane this morning in uh, Mark chapter 16. If you have your Bible, just flip over there. There's a couple of things I want to kind of lift out, and we're going to land this plane. And it says, Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices that they might come and anoint him. See, even the people that walked with Jesus still suspected, even though he told them time and time again that he was going to have to die and be raised from the dead, they still were coming to prepare a body that they were fixing to find out was not there. And it says that they might come and anoint him. And in, in verse 2 it says, And very early in the morning on the first day of the week they came to the tomb, but the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? And you know, if you don't know Jesus today, you're probably thinking that Jesus was just a good man and that he's still in a tomb somewhere sealed up. But that's not the case. I mean, we serve a risen Savior. You hear me? A risen Savior. That's who we serve. He's not there. When they got there, what did they say? In verse 4 it says, But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And it was a group of women. And so we can understand that the group of women was, look, I'm trying to figure out why there wasn't a man with them. But there wasn't. It was a group of women going to prepare Jesus. No, the, the disciples were, were sulking in a room because they didn't listen to Jesus when they were with him and, and know that he was going to rise on the third day. But if we'll read God's Word and trust God's Word and look to Jesus, we can not just go and sit and sulk in a room when life isn't going our way and hard times come and we don't have all the right answers. And by the way, you'll never have all the right answers. I said it last week. There's nothing that you know that can convince men to be saved. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that does that. Now, I think we ought to be ready in season and out of season like Timothy talks about, but it's the power of the Holy Spirit that saves. But when they looked up, the, the stone had been rolled away, amen? And well, who did they see? They saw an angel of the Lord sitting there. And what did he say? In verse 6, it says, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. See, the, the angel didn't contradict what happened to Jesus. No, the angel did an amen. 
which we don't have an empty room and there's not any amens. I hope you amen in at your house. But it says, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He says, he is risen. And that's where he's at. He's sitting down at the right hand of the Father, like I said earlier. And he's waiting on God to say, go get him, son. And he's going to come back and he's going to receive men and women to himself who have declared that Jesus Christ is Lord. Let me ask you a question today. Who is Jesus to you? Who is this resurrected Savior? I mean, do you know him? Because if you don't know him, why not know him? I just pointed us to uh, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13. The reason why God put that scripture on my heart well, because when I got saved, Satan would all uh, oftentimes uh, just get after me about all the things I'd done prior to salvation. And, and then he would say, well, Lance, you did this. There's no way God could justify you from that. Yeah, there is. God's, Jesus Christ's blood at the cross of Calvary was sufficient to save from all sins. Not just some sins, not just the people that look really dirty in this life and the folks that look really broken. No, he's, he's able to save the prideful people too that think that just because they hadn't got out in society and marred their life that can be seen by the human eye. No, he's sufficient to save the prideful people too. Why don't we pray about that? Father in heaven, Lord, I pray as we have this time of reflection for this resurrection service. Lord God, that you would do a deep work in hearts. Lord, I pray you would continue to do a deep work in my heart. Lord, I pray that you would consistently show me that, Lord, I am always in need of you. But Lord, you are a sufficient Savior, ready to save. Lord, you'll go with us through trouble. Lord, you'll come to us in trouble. Lord, your word says you'll never leave us nor forsake us. We have the, if we, we have the comforter of the Holy Spirit that abides in us. And Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you that we have a risen Savior in Jesus Christ, who there is an empty tomb. Lord, they've looked for a tomb with your body in it for a long time, and they've never found it because you're sitting down at the right hand of the Father. And so, Lord, we anticipate the day that you come back and receive us unto yourself. But, Lord, until that day comes, I pray that, Lord, that your gospel would make its way to all the nations and you would make yourself known to, Lord, as many people as it can be saved. Lord God, I pray that all men would want to. But, Lord, we just don't see that when we look around in society. Lord, we just ask you that you would work in this time and, Lord, that you would just save people today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.